how are we doing, Emily, with people? We're doing good. I think I think we should get go ahead and get started. I'll just quickly um, introduce myself and make an announcement. Emily Vale, Executive Director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Uh, really happy to have Elise Myers here with us this morning. Uh, we have another upcoming lecture series later in February. We've started a new lecture series for student research and many of our students and the academic institutions across the Hudson River watershed are working on really cutting edge projects and really interesting findings that are applied information for water and watersheds. So we're giving them an opportunity to share their information and connect with watershed communities. So our next event, um, which is in partnership with Thirst, the Hudson River Subwatershed and Tributary Research Network will be on Tuesday, uh, February 23rd, and it'll be on COVID monitoring in wastewater at Siena College, which was really a student driven research project to track COVID-19 across the Siena College campus. So if you'd like more information on that, I'm going to drop into the chat um, the date, time, and link to register. And there's more information on that in our monthly digest newsletter as well. In terms of board members, I think I see Mary McNamara. I'm, uh, if I'm missing somebody else, I apologize. Got Dan Shapley on as well. Oh, good. Yeah, and part of the mission of the Watershed Alliance is to build these networks where we all know each other and can rise up and um, address topics as they as they emerge. Um, I'm sorry we can't meet face to face today, but th this is this is the gathering, and um, um, and thank you for all all for being here today. And happy birthday, Dan. Well, there you go. We're not going to sing for you, Dan. That's cacophonous on what on webinars. Um, so in any case. Um, yeah, so let's move into the program today. I'm so happy to have Elise Myers here today. Um, and um, uh, it, there was a switch for those of you who saw announcements. Um, it's always um, you know, the DEC changes their programs from times to time, time to times, and we interact with them. And so uh, the program that we had intended today um, or scheduled for today related to a program that I understand is changing. And so it made sense to suspend and return to that subject at a different time. Um, Elise is doing great work um, that she's gonna present uh, related to, to, um, to water quality uh, as it relates to enterococcus. And, and uh, I am looking forward to understanding the difference between particles and turbidity. That will be good for me as a hydrogeologist to understand the difference. Um, and the persistence of enterococcus and other uh, fecal contaminants in our waterways is obviously a super high priority. Um, Elise, I'm gonna let you um, say a little bit more about your background and we're so happy to have you here today. The time is yours, the, the time is ours as an organization and therefore primarily yours between now and 9.30. Um, today, I have a very hard stop at 9.30. So even if conversation is raging, I will drop off, but we normally close at 9.30. Um, and for those, as Emily said very well, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, she will field them to Elise in time remaining when Elise is done with her presentation. With that drum roll, Elise, thanks so much for being here and um, the floor is yours. I'll just quickly interrupt to say, we actually want the questions in the Q&A box, which I should have said. Okay. So conversation in the chat, the questions are, are easiest to manage in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. So um, proceed. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Russell. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm excited to talk to you all today about Entrococcus, um, turbidity, and particle association. Um, the screens are showing, uh, the slides are showing up all right for everyone. All right, wonderful. Um, so like Russell was saying, I'm doing my PhD at Columbia University slash Lamont Doherty um, Earth Observatory. And um, I'm in my last year there, so I'm finishing up. Um, so it's a good time to talk to people about what I've found because I have a good grasp on it at this point. Um, and and uh, I'm trying to think of what else I should say. I think that my background in general, um, you could say it's like biological oceanography um, or urban oceanography, but I also do um, theoretical ecology. So mathematical models mixed in to try and better understand an ecosystem and create predictive methods. So with that, I will just jump right in. All right, so this is not something I need to stress here, but this is one of the first slides that I always show 
uh, my presentation just to get people an orientation for where we're where we are what we're thinking about so i'm particularly focused on the lower hudson river estuary section which is what's pictured here um so hudson river estuary as many of you know um, has a well-known history of environmental degradation and has consistent problems with sewage contamination though the frequency and intensity of that contamination varies from place to place throughout the estuary um and I don't necessarily know that the orientation will be super helpful here. Um, so usually I give these talks at much broader audiences, but of course we've got our Long Island Sound here, Atlantic Ocean, Manhattan. I am currently around the end on Manhattan. Um, so it's really great to be able to be, talk with all of you um, from such a distance. And a lot of times my field samples are a little bit south of the Tappan Zee. Um, though I do also work with the wonderful organization Riverkeeper um, and get a lot of samples throughout the, throughout the river as well. So we have seen strong improvement in water quality in the Hudson River throughout recent years. Um, so this is a, an image coming from um, the NYC DEP report um, in 2012. And so this is just showing on the y-axis our enterococcus or bacterial counts, pardon, um, so cells per 100 mil. Um, and then we have our <clears throat> time along the x-axis here. And so we're seeing both enterococci in blue and then our fecal coliform in red there. Um, and so we're generally seeing concentrations are going down. Um, as many of you probably know, that that's uh, at 1972 is when we're seeing the Clean Water Act um, when it is passed, and then within that next decade, you're seeing a lot more of a, a lot more improvements in the fecal coliform concentrations. Um, so it took about 10 to 20 years for it to reach pretty acceptable levels, and in the last 20 years, 20 30 years, we've seen less overall change um, in the actual concentration. So if we see we've kind of gotten to this plateau period here. Um, but we're, we need localized improvement. There's still some areas that have very high concentrations. While well, it looks better overall, we still have some issues that we need to deal with. And one of the things I want to draw your attention to is this idea of like irregular and high contamination, because that's a motivation for me for this work. So now we enter the enterococci versus all of the other indicator debate. So I use enterococci in my work as an indicator of sewage pollution, um, and it's used in water quality assessment in brackish waters in particular. So. E. coli is something that um, we use more often in freshwater systems, but e Enterococcus is the only brackish um, EPA approved fecal indicator bacteria. So I wanted to use what was um, what was used by the EPA. So what would be the most useful and practical for, for organizations that were trying to use this data for supporting their own management or supporting their own advocacy. And so Enterococcus is found commonly in warm-blooded animals like ourselves in our intestines usually. Um, it's very uncommon in uncontaminated water. And it's known as a fecal indicator bacteria because it indicates the presence of sewage or feces. I just put up some images here of the ways that you may have seen it, may have encountered it. So the first one on the left there is a plate that was actually collected from a Riverkeeper cruise um, by my colleague Carol Knudsen. Um, and so there you're looking at how many of those boxes light up and you get your most probable number concentration of enterococci. I instead actually use the plates. Um, so that's what's shown on the right there. So essentially you're filtering water um, onto this small filter, putting that on top of MEI auger, everything that Enterococcus wants to eat, incubate it for um, one day at 41 Celsius, and then you count them afterwards. Then you count like how many versus the amount of water that went through it. I tend to do that one because it's a little bit more accurate, um, just in terms of like actually being able to count the, the number of cells. And for the experiments I do, it's really helpful to actually count the colonies themselves. Um, so uh, both of them do work really well. And actually I've done a long uh, study on whether or not they match really well and they do match really well. So that we can luckily be very confident in. So why do we think enterococci is a good indicator? Um, there's a epi strong epidemiological correlation. So here we have two plots that are stacked on top of each other. The axes are the same. So we have the NGI, so the number of gastrointestinal illness rate basically um, per thousand swimmers. So people being sick as you increase. And then the concentration of enterococci along the x-axis there, so increasing again to the right. And so despite a lot of noise, we see that there's a pretty positive trend. And so something I like to say um, when I'm giving talks is like we think about this as like where there's smoke, there's fire. So where there's enterococcus, there's probably going to be this higher gastrointestinal illness rate. So thinking again like canary in the coal mine, all sorts of different analogies that I use to try and make sure that this is really accessible. And so, like I was saying, despite that noise, there's a pretty strong trend that we're seeing. Both of them are increasing upwards. And then the EPA set a, set a threshold of enterococci concentrations as guidelines for public recreation. And I've just marked that here. And so essentially it's like, okay, under this amount of enterococci, 
we have fewer rates of um, gastrointestinal illness, this is a safer um, range for the concentrations to be within. And why is it actually that we see this epidemiological concern? It's because enterococci correlates with microbes of concern, which are actually what's causing the illness. So enterococci itself is not pathogenic. Um, there are some people, there are cases that have been reported, typically they are inside um, hospitals, um, like a, an infection would you get in a hospital, but from the environment, people are more likely to get sick from these other, these other organisms. So I have plotted here, again, all of them have consistent and axes. Um, so we have enterococcus concentration is on the x-axis increasing to the right. And then we have the concentration of the different groups on the y-axis there. So the first one is from Young 2013, looking at ampicillin resistant bacteria. So we have our antibiotic resistant bacteria increasing with enterococci, which makes sense coming from a sewage, right? Um, and then also we have Shigella and Salmonella that are increasing with um, the concentration of enterococcus as well. And so those are some data that I've measured um, in the past few years. So in general, enterococcus correlates with those microbes of concern. They are not the pathogens, but they indicate these pathogens that are there. And so while I said that, of course, we've seen significant improvement in water quality in the Hudson River over time, we still have to think about um, that, that variability, that high irregular co contamination. So here is um, a plot and a map from a study by Gregor Mullen um, in 2019. So we have um, basically all of these letters here are the different field sites. Um, and they're plotted along the x-axis here. And now our concentration of enterococcus is along the, the y-axis here. So what we're seeing um, throughout all of these samples is that the geometric mean exceeded the EPA recommended threshold in all of those different sites. But we also see that those error bars are huge, right? So there are times where we measure the concentrations of enterococcus and it's totally fine. Um, there's other times where it's extremely hot. So that irregular high um, contamination, we're seeing a lot of variability. So this tells us that sewage pollution is still a problem. On average, we're still seeing issues, um, but also it really matters on the day, matters the conditions. So what's really going on there? And so that was the motivating question for a lot of this work. So that the high variability, um, is it just because there's a high variability in the inputs of sewage? Um, and not necessarily, right? So persistent in transport of those exogenous bacteria also contributes to that high variability of sewage pollution. So how they move within the ecosystem. And so the way that we can address that potentially is doing a lot of frequent sampling. But as many of you know, that is very cost intensive. It's time intensive, trying to organize everything, get people who are in the field. So the alternative to that is to then think about doing water quality monitoring with predictive mechanisms. And so then the challenge um, is can we predict the concentration of indicator bacteria and potential pathogens in the absence of intensive sampling, which is what I've been working on. And so the general way that I've been thinking about this, so I came from a theoretical ecology background before this, so a lot of mathematical models was, okay, can we incorporate field sampling, um, experimental data, statistics on our model, like a really rigorously validated model, um, can we use all that and put it into a framework that actually gives us a, a sense of like how long these bacteria last. So before we dive into those details, there's a few more things we need to make sure we all are on the same page. And so this gets to that particles versus turbidity question. So when I talk about particle association, it is a, an operational definition only. So essentially, if I'm passing something through a filter, I'm passing a whole water sample from a filter, um, that which goes through is free living. And this is a larger pore size filter. I used five microns. Um, and then if it does not pass through, then that's gonna be my particle associated fraction. So then those are those two different, two different fractions there. And so I have my little graphic up here, which you'll see many times in the right-hand corner. So if it's the green dot that's attached to this yellow circle here, particles are not necessarily this regular. Um, that's representing my particle associated fraction. And then the green dots kind of hanging out by themselves, that's my free living fraction. So when we see um, sewage contamination, we oftentimes see these particle-laden plumes. And so this is an example from a photo uh, of, from, taken by Riverkeeper looking at a combined sewer overflow in Manhattan. So um, as you might be able to see, we have this pretty turbid plume that's coming out here um, right into the water. So it's much more turbid than the water right next to it. Um, and if I were to measure inside of that plume, I would see high, count, uh, high counts of fecal indicator bacteria. So we know that there are these particle-laden plumes that have a lot of enterococci, a lot of fecal bacteria. And all bacterial groups can be particle associated or free living. And this, this amount varies for those different groups. 
So here I've plotted some of the data that I've been collecting. So this is looking at um, four different bacterial groups. So we have Enterococcus, Salmonella, Shigella, and Vibrio. Um, the first three are in blue because they are enteric, whereas the Vibrio in the Hudson is probably coming from another source. And so that was the sanity check that I was running at the same time as these other experiments. This is just to show you that it's highly variable, right? We've got these large error bars again, but it's also not negligible. So we do need to think about particle association. And there's a higher proportion of particles uh, of bacteria that are particle associated in feces and in sewage pollution than in the background community, which is why we've got our little um, poop emojis there. Um, I guess my work lends itself to that quite often when you think about sewage work. So why would there be more bacteria on particles? So now we know that there are more of them, why? Particles are generally considered to be a more favorable environment. And that's because of some of the benefits that being attached to a particle can attribute to those, those organisms. So one thing we can think about, so if we look at these, the little dummy particle bacteria, particle associated bacteria that I have here, if, it, if you're the bacteria that's on the bottom, then you're potentially getting shaded from sunlight. And we think about these sewage bacteria, these fecal bacteria, they live inside of our guts where the sun does not shine. So the general assumption um, is that when they go into a water body, that is a not ideal environment for them. So they die quite rapidly. So if you're getting shaded from the sun, so you're not getting um, subjected to UV infection or uh, disinfection, right? You potentially are gonna last longer. There's also higher sinking rates. So potentially moving them out of those sunlit upper waters um, to deeper waters, so again, less sun exposure. Also, there's potentially localized nutrients. There's potentially physical stability. There's a whole host of benefits that could be attributed to these, these bacteria just by being attached to a particle there. So how should we think about a system then if we know these background pieces of information and we know our question, how do we visualize that? So I basically created this kind of image in my head um, and now want to share this with you. So I think about my dummy system. I've got my sediments. I've got a single point discharge just to make life a little easier for visualization purposes. So I'm going to say in this case, I have a uni or, yeah, unidirectional water flow here. So we're going just this way. In my discharge, I'm going to have particle associated, rimmed in yellow, or the free living, just the green dots by themselves. I'm going to have both of them coming out from a combined sewer overflow, a wastewater treatment plant outfall, anything like that, that they'll be coming out together. Then they're going to be subjected to some major loss terms. So light loss um, has been measured extensively throughout um, the literature and is the major loss rate for fecal bacteria. Again, thinking about UV, what that does to bacteria, um, and in general thinking they are not in their ideal environment. The particle associated bacteria will sink, right? Not the free living ones, those will travel with the water kind of like tracers. Um, and then I just have this in two different groups here because different particles will sink at different rates, right? There's gonna be actually a distribution, not just one sinking rate. And going back to that, not the ideal environment, we have to think about dark period loss. So in the background of everything, so when they're not exposed to light, there's going to be some sort of loss term um, based off of what we've been reading in the field, based off of theory in the field, that it's like, okay, this is not an ideal environment. So those are the main components that we need to think about when constraining this system. So going back to those questions then, so it's like how does particle association impact the transport and persistence of sewage derived microbial contamination, in this case enterococci, but I can't answer that until I answer this first question, which is how does particle association impact the major loss rates of those bacteria? And so this is broken down into a model component, which is that upper component, that larger scale um, taking a high, um, from a high vantage point, and then versus the empirical testing, which is where we get into the nitty gritty of how does this affect those major loss rates. So my general sampling procedure will look very similar to some of you. So I go out, I collect the water, near surface bucket cast samples. I then go back to the lab, I separate the free living and the particle associated. So this is what I was saying when I meant that um, the free living fraction, you can see in, in that image too, goes down to the bottom there whereas my particle associated fraction is staying up at the top. I then take the particle associated fraction after a rinse step um, and it's put inside these 50 mil tubes and then they're agitated to shake the microbes off of the particles. Um, otherwise you can have a particle that has a couple microbes attached to it and then if I'm trying to grow it on a plate, um, it's not gonna work out very well. I wanna get them as isolated as possible so that each cell grows up into a, an individual distinct colony that I can count. 
And then I take this water, reconstitute it, or I take this water directly, the free living fraction, and then that's when I filter it through on this vacuum flask um, and filtering rig. And so then I collect the, basically the bacteria on this filter, the water goes through. I then incubate them on their specific media and then enumerate and calculate concentration. This one is not Enterococcus, this is Vibrio. I just think it's very pretty. So that's why it's there. It's a little bit more exciting than an Enterococcus plate, which you've seen just before. So the main experiments, the first one was the temperature dependent, our dark period loss, right? So I thought about um, what are the things that would affect dark period loss? Potentially temperature. I mean, we have these huge swings in temperature in the Hudson River. Um, and previous papers have, have highlighted that at higher temperatures, you see faster decay. Um, lower temperatures, you see kind of this uh, stable concentration of bacteria. So I thought, let me test those different temperatures and see what it is that we get in terms of those rates. So I had um, two time points, or three time points, sorry. So I have my initial time point and then 24 hours and 48 hours because these are very slow rates. Um, those are some of the bottles that I use for this. Um, so 18.5 and 28 degrees Celsius. And then for my light induced loss, um, I had two different treatments. Um, there was a water bath that was kept consistently at 18 degrees Celsius to make it comparable to the other study, the temperature dependent loss. Um, and because this loss rate is much larger, um, it's much more dominant than the time point was very short. So it was only two hours. So zero, one and two hours uh, to be able to actually count the um, amount of decay or mortality for those bacteria for Enterococcus in particular for this talk. And I have my light and dark treatments together. So I have some dark bags in here as well as some light UV permeal bags. Let's dive right into that data. What did that say? So. Here's just some of the data that I collected from this experiment. This is just looking at the means. Um, so I have my free living. You're gonna see these, these uh, graphics again many times. So free living is just our green particle associated here is this attached to this yellow dot. Um, so we're seeing that we have this increase in mortality. So our free living, our cells are dying a bit faster than comparably to the particle associated ones. And in fact, particle associated cells grew in the dark, which was very confusing. Um, not what I expected. So that is telling us that it's actually beneficial to be on a particle because there's this net positive growth rate. It's low. This is only 0.33 per day, um, but that is very different than the minimal decay that we're seeing in the, the free living fraction, which is almost the ex just exact opposite sign, right? Same magnitude. So that's something that we can say, looks like particles benefit enterococca there. What about light induced loss? Again, a significant benefit that we're seeing here. So now we're looking is the particle associated um, and we're seeing the free living fraction decays two times faster than the particle associated fraction, about two times. And if we compare it to the temperature dependent one, so when I mentioned before, this is the dominant loss rate, let's make sure that we're correct. Yes, right. 100 times greater for the free living fraction, um, the particle associated fraction 55 times greater and also it's a negative sign. So. The loss we expected did occur in the light. We had to change a lot of the, the words that we used because we expected everything to be lost. And now we have this positive growth in the dark. And just to um, reiterate, the data that I'm going to be using for the model is what is comparable between those two studies. So thinking about our 18 degrees Celsius for the dark period loss, as well as the 18 degrees Celsius light rates that I've just calculated here. And then the final parameter that we needed to define was sinking rates. Um, so just to orient ourselves on these plots here. So we have on the top one, time on the x-axis, percent remaining in suspension on the y-axis. So this is what we're looking now at the free living in yellow versus the particle associated. And so we're seeing that in terms of what's remaining in suspension over time, the free living fraction does not significantly leave um, suspension, whereas the particle associated fraction does sink over time. So that's for our first point there, particle associated enterococci is the only fraction that actually sinks. The free living one we can assume passes or travels as a tracer more so, so with the water. Um, and then the second plot at the bottom here, so now we have our sinking rate per day along the x-axis and then our percent with sinking rate greater than x. So it's basically saying that like, um, so if I'm looking at the bottom here, so we have like our sinking rate per day x. So if I go up to here, 20% um, or like a little under 20% of them sink faster than that. So this is just giving us a sinking rate distribution. So it's trying to tell us like, this is generally what's happening if you measure, um, this is through a graduated cylinder experiment. So like measuring over time, how much is sinking through. 
complicated to put into a model because it's a really nice uh, distribution that tells us a lot more um, information. But to pull out something that's really useful for a model, the median sinking rate was a meter per day. So that's what I ended up using for the sinking rate for the, um, the actual model. So experimental summary, we saw that particle association decreased light loss, right, by about half. It decreased the dark period loss. In fact, we saw a dark period growth for the particle associated bacteria. And we saw this increase in sinking. So for the first question, we can say particle association does increase enterococci survival. It affects these major loss rates that we're considering for this system. But what does that mean for environmental persistence in the Hudson River and also beyond? So all of the information from those experiments was added into a one-dimensional model looking at a water column system. So I took my experiments, created an environment, and then that's what I used to create this model that separately measures the concentration of the free living bacteria and the particle associated bacteria, which was a big step forward in these types of models. Um, these populations were not considered as distinct before. And as you can probably guess from the survival experiments that you just saw, there's going to be a difference in these two fractions. We do need to think about that. So for those who are um, more of the, the math nerds like myself, um, I want to just give you like a peek um, at the actual model itself. So um, those rates that we were talking about before, those are first order decay rates. Um, so that would be like my lambda FL would be that term that I, um, those rates that I had just been defining. Um, and so that's them parameterizing this exponential decay in the concentration of the free living bacteria. So this FL concentration of the free living bacteria. We also have diffusivity, which I'm using to model to simulate turbulence. So the water is moving, right? And so we're going to have some of those cells moving up and down um, because of that. So instead of doing some sort of advection term, diffusivity gives us a good sense of just like an overall turnover that we're getting, overall smearing. And then I'm looking at the population change over time. That is the variable that I am um, trying to hammer down on. And so I'm using a pretty typical advection diffusion decay framework for this. Um, something you would commonly see um, advection diffusion part in a lot of those fluid dynamic models, but then adding in this decay piece because that's what I've constrained in the lab. And then like I was saying, one of the big advances of this model is that there's explicit inclusion of particle associated and free living rates. So having those different lambda PA versus lambda FL parameters. And then also we have to remember that sinking only happens for the particle associated fraction. So this term right here is only gonna be incorporated for DCPA the concentration of the particle associated bacteria over time. And so just to um, give us a little bit more sense of like what's going on in that water column, I am modeling water or modeling light, sorry, as linearly, the light loss is linearly proportional to the depth in the water column. And that's because um, when you think about the diffuse attenuation coefficient of light, so how does light decrease as you go from the surface to the bottom, it's this exponential decay as well. So I'm modeling it, um, this term here, this e to the negative kdz, um, should look very familiar for those of you who look at light attenuation, and I'm just um, using my lambda then to, um, I'm using, so lambda z equals lambda naught, and then it's basically getting controlled by that parameter, that e minus kd, so however much light is attenuating is then controlling how much light loss we have. And so that's consistent for both of those terms. And then before I go into any of the results, I just wanted to remind ourselves that the temperature in this model is set at 18 degrees Celsius. The sinking rate is set at one meter per day. Um, I'm simulating over a 20 meter deep water column with a um, delta Z step of one meter. I'm looking at a sunrise discharge and I have a 16 hour, eight, 16 eight hour cycle. So that's 16 hour day sinusoidal and then eight hour night. Um, and then all of this is parameterized for enterococci. So I've measured these rates for other bacterial groups as well. I've only showed you the enterococci rates and that's what I'm using in this one. And now I just wanna draw your attention to this. This is the sinking rate now. So that V term that we had before sinking rate. So how do we measure persistence? This is an example output of three simulations within this model. So along our X axis, we have time increasing. So we have it up to 72 hours. And along the Y axis, we have our concentration of enterococcus. So this right now is set up for um, Hudson River KD, and KD is our basically our turbidity or our light attenuation. So higher number of KD means that the light attenuates faster, means your water is going to look more, um, a little bit darker. So then I have it over, simulating over three different diffusivity values. So this zero 
would be a perfectly quiescent pond. So there's like no wind, there's no nothing, there's no mixing in that. Um, then there's a mixing lake. So gentle, very gentle mixing. And then 0.01 Hudson River conditions. So very much faster mixing. So what would we get from this, this, uh, this type of plot here? It's hard to compare them because we see these different slopes. We see slightly different dynamics. The way that I then look at that is using T90. So T90 is this metric, and it's basically the time it takes for 90% of those bacteria to decay away. So I have put on the, on the plot here, this is a line that marks 10%. And so basically wherever each of those curves touches that line, that's going to be my T90. You drop that line down, it becomes the T90. So each curve has a different one. So even though we see these kind of wonky dynamics in the middle, that is the, the value that we're using for um, whether or not these bacteria are persisting. So now that we know how to extract that T90 value from those curves, we need to think bigger. So this is how I parameterize the model. This is the general output. There's nothing on the plot just yet, don't worry. I wanted to orient ourselves before we brought in the data. So along the y-axis, that is that KD value that I mentioned. And so KD, you can think of it as turbidity, so as how dark the water is. And then on my x-axis, I have diffusivity, which as I mentioned, is what I'm using to simulate turbulence. So in this bottom corner here, that's where we'd be at a place like Lake Tahoe. So you can see through the water, you can even paddleboard with your dog on it. Very clear, very calm. If I go along that axis up to the top, I'm getting to a very dark water body, but it's very calm again. So thinking about like a really um, mud puddle, muddy puddle. And instead, if I go from the origin to the right, I'm getting to a very clear system. Again, I haven't gone up on that turbidity axis, but I'm very turbulent. So I'm seeing something like Big Sur in California. And then if I instead go up to this upper corner, I'm looking for a dark and choppy system. That's what I'm going to be getting. And as some of you may have recognized, that is the Hudson River. So that's our that's the condition that I'm thinking about more for the Hudson River. And then the last thing to just point out before we put in the data is that this is the persistence here. So the T90 um, is plotted there in the, the color scale. So as we go up closer to the pink contours, we're seeing greater persistence. So let's bring in this data. So looking at the free-living Enterococcus, what we're seeing is that, let's see, here we go, oh, sorry. Um, we have higher persistence in our turbid and turbulent waters. So in our Hudson River conditions, our Hudson River situation, we're going to be seeing greater persistence. So we're seeing more around like 40, 50 hours, as opposed to if we're in like a much clearer system like Lake Tahoe, um, still we're seeing basically pretty, pretty low persistent time scale. And so we can think about that as like, so if we are, if we're up here in this upper corner in the Hudson River, that water is pretty dark, right? So there's going to be less light penetration. There's going to be less light induced loss. Um, and also if it's pretty turbulent, you're actually smearing those bacteria. And so the bacteria in the system are being ejected into the surface. So it's a surface water discharge. Um, if, there, if there's no turbulence, those bacterial cells are not moving down into the water where they would be exposed to less light. So those are the main factors that are at play here. And now let's think about our particle associated fraction, right? Because we know those rates are different. So does that actually relate or result in different persistence? Yes. So these are plotted on the same color bar um, again here. So we see right away that there's a lot more pink in this, right? So the particle associated cells, if you remember, the dark period loss was actually dark period growth, right? And so that's enough to actually get them to this really high persistence, um, potentially quote unquote, infinite persistence because they we cut the time window at 100 hours. So they persisted longer than 100 hours. And at that point, um, from a management perspective, there's other things that are going on that are more important than whether or not these bacteria are surviving, right? There's mixing, um, there's all sorts of those different elements. So overall, we're seeing relatively similar patterns in that if we're getting up to these higher turbidity, higher turbulence conditions, we're seeing greater persistence. Um, but we are seeing that overall, we've just like kind of cranked it up these bacteria persist much longer. So we can say particle associated bacteria persist much longer up to four days in certain areas or in certain conditions. And important for us here is that both of these fractions persist longer in turbid and turbulent waters. And then we have to think like, how much can we trust this model, right? Because I'm a big fan of the phrase that is like all models are wrong, some are useful. And so this was my, can this model be useful? Is it actually useful? What does it tell us? So one of the things I did was I performed a lot of sensitivity tests. Um, so here we're seeing T90 variability on the y-axis, and this is the these are the different um, sensitivity tests I was running. 
And so basically this is just like from the mean values that I was running simulating forward with, how different are these predictions from that? And that's basically that T90 variability. So the higher it is, the more variability you're seeing between the mean value and whatever I'm predicting. So I took um, all of those, all that empirical data, right, forms a distribution because I performed those experiments many different times. So here's an example like distribution up here. So I would say, okay, I took this mean value and that's what I ran. So maybe I took like that center point there, I took that mean. However, um, I'm then not thinking about this distribution, right? So what I did is I subsampled from that distribution a thousand times and ran the model forward. Um, and I did that for every single value that I had on there. So sinking rates, light rates, temperature rates, um, and for the different fractions themselves and ran them under um, an estuary and a lake condition. And so what we're getting from this, so here now we're seeing the variability. So I have my estuary um, is the clump that's on the right together and then lake is um, to the left together. Um, and then if they're stippled, that's a particle associated one. So overall, we're seeing that we have higher variability when we vary the temperature rate. So that seems like to be where we should focus more efforts in the future is actually thinking about that temperature dependent rate, even though we think of light dependent loss as like the most critical loss rate, that macro growth really means a lot. Um, and then we can also see that in estuaries, we have greater variability than we do um, in lakes. And that's probably because we have this higher turbulence, we have this higher turbidity. So you're moving those cells throughout the water, you're changing the, what they're being exposed to. And then I also varied all of those rates together. Um, and so this is now, if you take every single one of those rates and you subsample everything, so everything is completely random. And for this test, I was trying to see how robust is that prediction that particle associated enterococci last longer and persist longer in a system than free living enterococci. So if I vary all of the rates from different values throughout those distributions, do I still get that one prediction as true? And yes, that was actually true. So we can say pretty confidently that particle association does increase the persistence of enterococci, even if you get like the lowest dark rate with the highest light rate, it does end up still working out. So overall, we can say beneficial for these enterococci to be on particles. And then this gets us to this, this last piece for like our model conclusion, right? Is that particle association does consistently increase enterococci persistence. So not just the survival in those loss rates, it also affects that persistence now that we've been able to model it. And apologies that that last uh, bar popped up at the end there, that was not supposed to be covered until then, um, but in sinking rates, um, so it's only the particle associated cells that would be affected by this, right? Of course, so I didn't vary the sinking rate of the free living cells, they didn't have a sinking rate. Um, but again, we're seeing that in the lake, we see this change in an estuary, um, those just all went to infinite persistence. And so there was no difference in persistence. So there's one more thing that I was just, as I kept thinking about this, this is a very long paper if you do ever read it. So hopefully this will be like the way to not read it. Um, so I thought, okay, now we understand that this is pretty consistent. We understand the rates that we're getting. We have a good, good handle on the model. Is there an effect of discharge timing on this? So remember I told you that my discharge was simulated at sunrise um, in a 16 hour um, day, eight hour night. So a sunrise discharge means the greatest light exposure possible, right? I was assuming that they are coming out 6 a.m., getting irradiated all day, um, and then we're seeing this decay in concentration. So my hypothesis then would be that there, if there's a later discharge, if it's coming closer to sunset, there's going to be less light exposure, potentially longer persistence. And so in practice, what this means is like if we think about discrete discharges, so like the combined sewer overflow photo I showed you earlier, um, they may have differing persistence because of the different timing. So it might actually matter when in the day a combined zero overflow happens um, for how long these bacteria persist afterwards. So here we have, so we have an image that's moving, so we'll stay here for a little bit. So the bottom part of this image is what you've seen before. We have our free living on the left and then our particle associated on the right. So those patterns should look relatively similar to what we've just seen. And then at the top, we have the difference in those particle associated versus free living. So particle associated minus free living. It's always greater than zero because the particle associated fraction always persists longer. And so we're moving throughout this day. This is my like dial cycle multiplier um, increasing basically like, so you're having higher light um, exposure, like stronger sunlight, right? As you get later in the day and then eventually it starts to come back down. Well, it's kind of a lot to take in. I just want to point out that the free living fraction, so overall, this 
increases persistence. So if you have a di discharge later in the day, you increase persistence because you're decreasing this light exposure. If you think about a free living bacteria, if it's being ejected onto the surface of in the surface waters, right? If it's being, um, if it has longer time to be subjected to turbulence and get moved down deeper, it's going to persist longer. So that's why the free living fraction is most affected by this, um, making that mixing down possible. The particle associated fraction is minimally impacted. And so you can see that here in this plot here. So we've got most of it is this pink contour, right? There are times where we are seeing more of that pink contour kind of encroaching on the other lighter colored contours. The reason why it's minimally impacted is because the majority of them are infinite T90 already. So it's not necessarily that we're saying anything about those different dynamics within that system, but just saying that um, in the window we're looking at, particle associated cells pretty much persisted uh, T90 infinite or over 100 hours. And then if we think about this top plot here, what is the difference between them? As you have, as you go to like a later and later discharge time, you decrease that difference between the particle associated and free living cell. And that should make sense when we think about that the free living fraction increases in persistence with later times and the particle associated is minimally impacted. But that just means that when we're thinking about for management applications, we don't see as much of a difference between those fractions later in the day. So I know I threw a lot at you. So we're gonna have just like a quick conclusions wrap up. So um, thinking about our particle association, what did that mean empirically? So it decreased our background loss rates for enterococci. It decreased light induced loss rates, right? So we had, it actually was background growth um, and then light induced loss, it decreased it by about half. It alters transport via sinking. This was the only fraction that had sinking. Um, and just like something that I wanna throw out there, even though I don't have time to talk about it now, is that like, Particle association has different but similar impacts for those different genera that I've been looking at. So like Salmonella and Shigella, um, very similar benefits of particle association, but slightly different magnitudes of the effect. So overall, particle associated enterococci had this increased persistence due to the combination of that differential growth uh, and loss rates, those differential rates between the free living and the particle associated fraction and the sinking. And when we have a later discharge, we know that this increases the simulated persistence and decreases the differential persistence between those two fractions. And so I like to usually bring this back for what does this mean? Like, why is this important? So what does this mean for future water quality modeling? So if sewage pollution models neglect the impact of particle association that we have these two different fractions that behave differently in the water, we could underestimate sewage pollution right, sewage pollution prediction and the persistence, and particularly in systems like the Hudson River where it's more turbid and turbulent, right, where that we have that higher persistence of both fractions. And that means we could have this underpredicted risk of waterborne illness for people. So that's why this incorporating particle association is important for future work. And so with that, I would like to say thank you very, very much for your time, um, for spending an early morning with me. Um, I've really enjoyed um, getting to know this organization more, and I have put up there a few, uh, like some of my contact information, wanted to acknowledge my advisor, um, Andrew Jewell, um, my advisory committee, and then also Riverkeeper um, for being a wonderful partner, and then my funding comes from NASA. Great, thank you so much, Elise. We have some really great hard hitting questions here and I'll just start by saying several of them acknowledge and, and say thanks for giving such a great talk and explaining this all so well. Um, so combined sewer overflows that release sewage uh, into the Hudson River often occur on rainy days, not usually sunny days. Does that make the persistence uh, of um, enterococcus worse? That, yes, that is a fantastic question. Um, and that's um, definitely something that I've been thinking about a lot is that um, our, yes, our combined sewer overflows tend to happen, right, when it's raining. So that quarter of an inch of rain in Manhattan is what's leading to those sewer overflows. So um, based on this work, it's kind of like an ideal situation would be if you're gonna have to have rain that immediately afterwards you have sun, right? To be able to have this maximum, um, maximum radiation, uh, maximum uh, mortality of those fecal bacteria but we do typically tend to see like pretty cloudy days after it rains. So that persistence could be significantly longer. And that also then changes um, how we think about where that bacteria might go. Um, because those free living cells, like we just um, saw, like they travel with the water, they don't sink, right? So we could use fluid physics to better understand where the free living cells are going 
So while there's no sunlight exposure, we see them moving along and potentially like think about those as our hotspot areas. But the particle associated cells, because they sink, they don't travel with the water exactly. So that takes a little bit of a different approach to try and figure out where those hotspots might be if it's cloudy and we've had a CSO and there's just no, we're not seeing enough um, decay because of sunlight. Great. Um, is resuspension of sediments and potentially associated um, fecal indicating bacteria accounted for in the model? Great question. Um, in this model, no, because the depth of the model is um, that 20 meters. So there is, so the, the bottom of the model basically accounts for there being some collection. So there's nothing, nothing falls out of the bottom of the river in this model. Um, but it does kind of stay there and it can like kind of move back up between that lower um, chunk of river, chunk of water, I guess, that I'm modeling and can go back up into the other um, layers. But I am not explicitly including resuspension um, just yet. It's absolutely, I'm glad that it was brought up because that's absolutely an important point because um, we've seen in, in our own data in the lab, but also in other people's work, um, that resuspension does contribute a lot um, to water quality. So if we like go through and we like wade in the water we stir up quite a bit of stuff. Um, we can dramatically increase those concentrations of bacteria in the water just by stirring that up. Um, that's something that I have been wanting to be able to add in um, and is not something I've been able to do at this point. Um, there's also like, I, when I was going through it, I was thinking a lot about, okay, like how does it actually resuspend? Like, do we have to consider bed shear stress and the, the stress of the water and all of that? Um, and it didn't seem like that was addressing the same question that I was doing here. But I think that that's a fascinating question, and I hope that either I can get to it or someone else can get to it, and I look forward to reading that work. Great, thank you. So in terms of swimming in the Hudson River after rain, um, does the model results give us a rule of thumb about what, what potentially to use? Um, Riverkeeper has a general rule of thumb that says to wait 48 hours to swim after rain, and it seemed like that was pretty good for the free uh, free living bacteria, but maybe not for the particle associated bacteria. Um, does it change for certain types of waters, these more turbulent systems? You know, can you give us sort of a rule of thumb about recreating in these water bodies after rainfall or after a sewage discharge? Yeah, um, that is a great question. So I tend to still use the Riverkeeper um, guideline of that 48 hours is an ideal time um, to at least give it that amount of time for there to be mixing for there to be this decay because remember that this is not actually including um, mixing like spreading it out across the river right so if I allowed it to spread out across I might actually have these lower concentrations um, coming in from that aspect of it as well that dilution effect um, I still would I still definitely recommend people that 48 hours in the Hudson because that's based on data that people that Riverkeeper has collected um, to actually see like okay what is the decrease in concentration over time whereas this is more theoretical um, and it's good to put those kind of things together. So what we can do is put this information together with that and say that if I was in a situation like if I was in Lake Tahoe, I would expect it to be maybe like a day um, because there water super super tranquil. There's a lot of sunshine and the light is penetrating pretty deep. So I would expect the fecal bacteria to decay really rapidly. But in a system like the Hudson, that two days, that's probably like our upper bound then um, on like what we'd expect for those situations that I showed you earlier. Great, thank you. Are you seeing any difference between salt water versus fresh water? Does chloride impact the mixing or sinking? Yes, that is a good question. Um, so, for this experiment, all of my samples were taken in the um, brackish portion of the river. So I was getting that mix of salty and fresh water. Um, and my salinities were usually around um, 8 to 16 PPT, I believe is the range that I had. Um, so I don't have data from fresher time periods. I did do a couple experiments actually just to see like, is there a difference in the mortality rate? Um, it was a lot easier to do the temperature dependent experience. So I did a lot of those kind of just like, oh, I have some water, let me throw it in here. And I didn't see a big difference in the temperature dependent um, loss on those bacteria. I think that, I mean, the question of um, the impact of par particles of salinity, I think is an absolutely valid question because we can think about the salt wedge and like, what are the interactions there? We have potentially more flocculation there. So we're having this generation of particles. What does that mean for persistence for how these bacteria live? Um, that's not something that I have been able to work on because I think that would require a lot more field sampling to really um, constrain all of that. 
Um, but I'm sure there's definitely an impact like where you're seeing that really strong mixing of the fresh and salt water. I wish I could give a better explanation than that. Um, but from my work so far, haven't seen a difference um, in especially the temperature dependent loss. Um, and most of this is, is constrained for that kind of brackish water. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, the next question I think is a good follow up on that. Um, so to assess, I'm just gonna read this because it's uh, there's a lot here. To assess whether water is considered safe for recreation, EPA rep recommends Entero for use in either fresh or brackish water and E. coli only for fresh water. Your research is really helpful in trying to understand some of the Entero patterns we've seen in the Hudson, which is both brackish and fresh. Is there anything you can say about these dynamics in smaller freshwater tributaries that feed the Hudson River? And how would you expect E. coli and Entero to differ, if at all, in their usefulness for assessment in freshwater tributaries? Great question. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try and like break it down into the different pieces there. Um, and I've got so it in front of me if you need a refresher. Okay, yeah, I yeah, probably will. Um, so for, for enterococci versus E. coli, um, yes, enterococci is definitely more useful in our brackish waters, while the E. coli, you're absolutely right, is more useful in our freshwater system, so like the trids. Um, enterococci um, tends to be a bit more robust than E. coli, so like I would expect it to be persisting longer. Um, that is just a hunch. Um, off of like thinking about um, some of the papers that we've, I've seen before that are looking at E. coli rates um, versus enterococci rates. Enterococci seems to like hang around a little bit longer. Um, so I feel like it might be able to be useful then as like that like upper limit basically. Um, but I do think that this work would be, it'd be really useful to have this kind of um, experiment done in a freshwater system and in freshwater to really better constrain exactly what would happen to E. coli so that we're not just guessing because at some point, I mean, the model of course has a lot of assumptions. Um, and so I, I make guesses in the model, but I try to make sure that they're very validated guesses <clears throat> and like that I have a really good reason for doing so. So that would be my intuition for the difference then between E. coli and Enterococcus there. Um, and I think that this can still be used to inform that because we're still generally seeing those same dynamics because we do know that E. coli is subjected to Light, high light induced loss rate as well. Um, we don't know if it's going to grow in the background. Um, it seems like from other papers that no, it's going to have this like minimal loss. Um, but then again, people haven't been looking at particle associated versus free living cells. So we might see that same kind of dynamic come up again. So I would say generally, the ideas that are here should be very applicable to E. coli, should be very applicable to the potential pathogens that are coming, that are traveling with those fecal indicator bacteria because they're coming from that same um, same environment. They're coming from a human, a warm-blooded animal, and then going into an unfamiliar, um, non-ideal environment. You might, did I get all the points of the question? I want to make sure I... Yeah, and then there was one point about uh, the dynamics in smaller freshwater tributaries mm -hmm. that feed the Hudson versus the Hudson proper, and there's another question here about freshwater tributaries that might be clear, but also fast moving, and you know, yeah. how you would expect these dynamics to translate. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so in our smaller trips, I feel like, and especially that they're clear, where you have your higher turbulence, I would think that you'd be able to have this, that, remember if we looked at before, um, actually I can just go back to it. Um, the predictions for, actually I can just use this one here. So um, if we were going to someplace that was pretty clear, right, but that was pretty turbulent, so I like our trips, it'd be more under these types of conditions. So like around this region here where we're seeing like pretty clear, but we have this really fast moving water. So we would still see based on like, based on the physics, based on the interaction of the physics with the, bi with the microorganisms that I've measured so far, all of that would point to having shorter scale persistence than we would in the Hudson River, um, the main channel, like where we're seeing higher turbidity. And of course, like um, that will vary throughout the Hudson River, right? Because turbidity is very different in um, the area that's closer to the harbor versus like if you're going up to the Tappan Zee Bridge. So that's part of the reason also why I wanted to model this over a bunch of different conditions because the Hudson River encompasses a lot of, like a large range um, in this turbidity and, and uh, turbulence scale here. Um, so I would say that we would probably see lower persistence within those tributaries based off of um, that increased light exposure. And also those um, tributaries are gonna be much shallower. Um, and so we potentially are having, first of all, more of that resuspension 
Um, but then we also are like those bacteria, even if they fall down to the bottom, they're gonna get knocked back up, right? Whereas in the Hudson River, um, those particle associated cells, they might sink and they may not even come back up to the surface. And so they may not even be a problem in, in terms of people getting in contact with them, like swallowing them or anything like that. But maybe we have this higher concentration of enterococci hanging out at slightly deeper levels in the Hudson. Guys, I need to leave. It's 9.30. Uh, thank you, Elise. Um, Emily, could you, if you'd like to field another couple of questions, that's great. I just need to leave. So, But thank you, and we'll see you all next month. Great. Thanks so much, Russell. Thank you. Um, we have some really great questions here. I'm just going to take one more, Elise, if you don't mind, because sure. it's about, it's a mechanism question. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, can fecal indicating bacteria become attached to suspended sediment? You mentioned that, that in the model, they were coming out as sediment attached part, attached to particles. Mm -hmm. um, but if water is very turbid, can fecal bacteria become attached to those suspended sediment particles? Yes, that is a great question. Um, so I think that the, let's see, it's really hard for us to empirically quantify that, yes, that is what's happening. I think that is what's happening because I would think that since there is this benefit to being attached to a particle um, and you know just being like just sticking, sticking to the particle accidentally and those bacteria potentially last longer. I say it's hard to quantify because when we measure the percent particle associated at the outfall um, versus like what we're seeing in the main water column, we're seeing usually pretty high particle concentration, particle associated concentration right at that outfall. And then it does drop off a bit um, when we go into the main channel. And so that's, um, it's like, is that because of differential mortality? Is it because we're having this shifting of like they're jumping from particle um, to free living? I feel like it's probably much more of a dynamic relationship. And right now I'm doing some work on the uh, microbiome. So I'm looking at 16S sequencing on particles versus free living. And the communities are really similar. Um, there's some differences but there's, but generally they're pretty similar. And to me, that suggests that we actually have this kind of dynamic exchange happening between the particle associated fraction and the free living fraction, because otherwise the communities would be, would be kind of different, right? They would just come in as particle associated and they would stay that way and wouldn't, um, would never exchange or anything like that. And I mean, just even in my experience, I knock them off of the particles with some agitation. I'm sure that's happening in the water as well. Um, and then also if we think about like random movement, um, a particle of free living bacteria at some point would probably collide and then get stuck together. So I wish I could say, I know exactly what's happening, but I hope that explains a bit of like my thought process for it and why I think that that's what's happening. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning, Elise. It's been really fascinating to learn about your research and there's so many important applications for water quality and recreation in the Hudson River. Um, so we'll close our breakfast lecture at this point and please join us next month. We'll be back on March 11th at 8.30 a.m. with a new talk. Um, if you're interested in learning about COVID uh, wastewater monitoring, please join us on February 23rd for our student speaker series and we hope you all have a great day.